was 3 a.m. when Alex heard the unmistakable sound of his school locker being slammed shut, echoing through the darkness of his room. This wasn't the first time the nightmares about school bullies had invaded his sleep, but tonight was different. The air felt heavier, and the shadows in his room seemed to whisper his name. In his dream, Alex found himself walking the deserted school hallways, the fluorescent lights flickering above. The usual cacophony of laughing and chattering students was replaced by an eerie silence, broken only by the distant sound of footsteps following him. Turning around, there was never anyone there, yet the feeling of being watched was overwhelming. As he approached his locker, the numbers on the combination lock began to spin wildly on their own. Finally, coming to a stop, the locker creaked open to reveal not the books and papers he had left, but a dark, seemingly endless void. From this darkness, a hand emerged, grabbing his shirt and pulling him towards the abyss. Alex tried to scream, but no sound came out. Just as he felt himself being swallowed by the darkness, he woke up, gasping for air. His room was quiet, but a cold draft made him shiver. That's when he noticed it. His bedroom window, previously shut, was now wide open, the curtains billowing in the wind. On the sill sat a familiar object that sent chills down his spine. His school ID, which he had lost months ago, long before the bullying started. Puzzled and frightened, Alex got up to close the window, but a shadow in the corner of the room caught his eye. It was too large to be his, and as it moved, it seemed to be creeping closer. The air around him grew colder, and the faint sound of whispers filled the room, echoing the taunts and jeers of his school bullies. But how could this be? He was alone, wasn't he? As the shadow loomed larger, the whispers became more distinct, repeating a name over and over. It wasn't his name, but one he recognized all too well, the name of the main bully who tormented him at school. The realization hit Alex like a wave of ice-cold water. Something or someone from the school was here, in his room, at 3 a.m. With his heart pounding in his chest, Alex backed away from the advancing shadow. The whispers grew louder, and the room seemed to close in on him. He could now make out the words among the whispers, phrases he'd heard during the day, twisted into sinister threats. The shadow seemed to feed on his fear growing larger and more defined, taking on the form of the school bully who had made his days a living nightmare. As the figure stepped into the moonlight streaming through the window, its features became clearer. It was an exact, albeit distorted, replica of the bully, but its eyes were hollow, soulless pits, and its smile was wide and malicious. Alex wanted to run, but his legs wouldn't move. He was frozen in place by fear. The figure spoke in a voice that was both familiar and terrifyingly foreign, dripping with malice. Missed me, Alex, it taunted, taking slow, deliberate steps toward him. The room filled with the sound of other lockers slamming shut, echoing around him, as if the nightmare of school had invaded his home. In a desperate bid for safety, Alex managed to stumble towards his bedroom door, flinging it open, only to find the hallway transformed into the school corridor he dreaded. Lockers lined the walls, their doors rhythmically opening and closing with no one in sight. The fluorescent lights flickered above, casting strange shadows that twisted and turned like writhing serpents. He ran down the hallway, the sound of his footsteps echoing loudly, mixing with the 
distant, mocking laughter of unseen bullies. Doors to classrooms swung open as he passed, revealing glimpses of moments when he felt most helpless and humiliated. Desks and chairs were upturned, and graffiti-covered walls displayed cruel messages aimed at him. As he reached the end of the corridor, he found himself at the entrance of the school gym, the site of many of his humiliations. The doors swung open on their own, revealing the dark, empty space inside. The only light came from the moon shining through the skylights, casting an eerie glow over the basketball court. The whispers were now deafening, and as Alex stepped into the gym, they suddenly stopped. In the silence, the sound of a bouncing basketball echoed, growing louder and closer. A figure emerged from the shadows, dribbling the ball. A twisted version of another of his tormentors. Its face, a grotesque mask of glee. Alex turned to flee, but found the gym doors had vanished, replaced by solid walls. The only way out was through the locker rooms, notorious for being the bully's favorite spot for their cruel games. He could hear the sound of showers running and the laughter of his tormentors, as if they were waiting for him inside. Stealing himself, Alex moved towards the locker rooms, each step heavier than the last, his heart racing with dread. The door creaked open, revealing the steam-filled room, the sound of water and cruel laughter growing louder. As he stepped inside, the door slammed shut behind him, trapping him in the nightmare. The steam in the shower area began to form shapes, twisting into the figures of his bullies. Their features exaggerated and menacing. They stepped out of the mist, surrounding him, their laughter piercing the air. Trapped and surrounded, Alex felt a surge of panic as the figures advanced toward him, their faces twisted into cruel smirks. They echoed the worst of his memories. Each step they took, fueled by his fear, the steam thickened, obscuring his vision, making the room feel smaller, more oppressive. Their laughter mixed with the hissing of the showers created a cacophony of horror that threatened to overwhelm him. Suddenly, the lights flickered and went out, plunging the locker room into darkness. Alex could only hear the sound of his own rapid breathing and the relentless approach of his tormentors. In the pitch black, he felt isolated, as if cut off from the world outside this nightmare. The bully's voices became indistinct, melding into a single, ominous drone. Just as he felt a hand grasp his shoulder, the lights blazed back on, revealing not the bullies, but empty space. The steam had cleared, and the locker room was silent and deserted. Confusion and fear battled within him as he tried to understand what was real and what was a product of his terror-stricken mind. Forcing himself to move, Alex found an exit door that seemed to appear out of nowhere. He pushed it open, stumbling into the cold night air. The school grounds were unrecognizable, shrouded in a thick fog that seemed to swallow the light. The familiar paths and buildings were gone, replaced by a twisted maze of shadows and shapes that moved just beyond the edge of vision. Alex felt drawn towards the school's old, abandoned building, a place rumored to be haunted, even during the day. Now, it loomed before him, its broken windows like dark eyes watching his every move. The air grew colder as he approached, and the whispers returned, now chanting a dire warning, urging him to turn back something compelled him to move forward, 
as if the answers to his torment lay within those crumbling walls. As he entered the building, the door slammed shut behind him, the sound echoing through empty halls. Inside, the atmosphere was thick with despair, the air heavy with the scent of decay. Graffiti-covered walls seemed to mock him with distorted faces, and the remnants of old school equipment were scattered around, covered in dust and cobwebs. Moving deeper into the building, Alex heard the faint sound of a piano playing from somewhere above. The melody was haunting, filled with sorrow and a strange familiarity. He followed the sound, climbing the rotting staircase, each step creaking ominously under his weight. The music guided him to an old music room, where the dilapidated piano played itself, the keys moving in a ghostly dance. Drawn to the piano, Alex reached out to touch it, but before his fingers could make contact, the music stopped abruptly, and the oppressive silence returned. He turned to leave, but the door through which he had entered was no longer there. Instead, he faced a corridor he had never seen before, lined with doors that seemed to breathe, pulsing in and out with a life of their own. Hearing a noise behind him, he turned to see the shadows coalesce into the forms of his bullies, their features even more monstrous and distorted. They began to advance down the corridor, their footsteps echoing ominously. Alex ran, opening doors only to find brick walls or more corridors behind them. The building, a labyrinth designed to confuse and terrify, as he navigated the endless halls, the line between reality and nightmare blurred further. The school's history, steeped in rumors of bullying, tragedy, and unresolved anguish, seemed to come alive, playing out its darkest moments. The Alex's breaths came in ragged gasps as he fled through the ever-changing corridors of the old building. The relentless pursuit of his nightmarish tormentors drove him deeper into the heart of the structure, where the air was thick with the weight of unspoken horrors. The building seemed alive, its very essence infused with the anguish and despair of those who had suffered within its walls. Each room he passed was a tableau of torment frozen moments of anguish from different eras, all eerily similar to his own experiences. Desks arranged in a circle with an empty chair in the middle, blackboards scrawled with taunts, lockers ajar with ominous darkness within. The building was not just a place, but a living memory of every act of cruelty that had occurred there. In his frantic escape, Alex stumbled upon an old library, its shelves groaning under the weight of moldy books, the air filled with the musty smell of decayed paper. The whispers here were louder, almost pleading, as if the books themselves were desperate to be heard. On a table lay a newspaper clipping from years ago, detailing a tragic incident where a bullied student vanished without a trace. The photo showed a boy with a haunting resemblance to Alex. Hearing the echoes of footsteps, Alex hid behind a bookshelf, peering through the gaps. The distorted figures of his bullies searched the room, their eyes glowing unnaturally in the dim light. They spoke in disjointed voices, each sentence a jumble of words that seemed both threatening and sad. Escaping the library, Alex found himself in the gymnasium's forgotten counterpart, an older, decrepit version filled with discarded sports equipment and banners that time had forgotten. The center of the room held a boxing ring under a solitary spotlight, where shadowy figures sparred silently, repeating the same movements over and over, locked 
in an eternal conflict. As he moved through the gym, the air grew colder, and his breath formed clouds in front of him. The echoes of past matches filled the room. The sound of gloves striking flesh. The cheers of the crowd. The cries of the defeated. The shadows seemed to play out the worst of the school's history. Each scene more violent and tragic than the last. A sudden chill made Alex turn, and through a cracked mirror on the wall, he saw not his own reflection, but a multitude of faces, all stepping onto the creaking boards of the stage. Alex felt every eye in the auditorium on him, the weight of their silent expectation pressing down. The noose above him swayed gently, as if stirred by an unseen wind, its shadow on the floor twisting like a dark serpent. The spotlight intensified, casting his shadow across the auditorium, elongating it until it merged with the darkness at the room's edges. The air in the auditorium thickened, and a palpable tension filled the space. Whispers echoed off the walls, growing louder, forming a chorus of voices from the school's past. They spoke of hidden truths and buried pain, each word resonating with the energy of unresolved tragedies. As the whispers crescendoed, the figures in the audience began to stand, one by one, their movements synchronized and deliberate. They turned their heads towards the back of the auditorium, where the double doors burst open, revealing a gust of wind that carried with it the decaying leaves and cold air of forgotten autumns. Through the doorway, a figure emerged, distinct from the others, its presence commanding silence. It was the headmaster of the old school, his visage stern and eyes burning with a cold fire, dressed in period attire that spoke of the school's early days. He walked down the aisle, his steps measured and echoing in the silent auditorium until he stood before the stage, looking up at Alex with an inscrutable expression. The headmaster's voice, when he spoke, was deep and resonant, filling the room with a sonorous power that seemed to make the very air tremble. He spoke of the school's legacy, a place of learning shadowed by sorrow and darkness, where the echo of every harsh word and cruel deed had soaked into the stone and timber, creating a tapestry of pain. The stage beneath Alex began to transform, the floorboards splitting and rising, forming shapes and scenes from the school's history. These were not mere illusions, but seemed all too real, as if time itself were unraveling to reveal the layers of stories hidden beneath the present. Scenes of past injustices played out in harrowing detail showing how the cycle of bullying and violence had perpetuated through generations, each act leaving a deeper scar on the school's soul. As the headmaster continued to speak, the scenes became more intense, and Alex found himself reliving not just his own experiences, but those of former students, feeling their fear, anger, and despair, as if they were his own. The boundaries between past and present blurred further, and he realized that the school, with its long and troubled history, had become a nexus of suffering, drawing in those who bore the weight of its dark legacy. Suddenly, the spotlight on Alex intensified, blinding him. When his vision cleared, he was no longer on the stage, but standing in a replica of his own classroom, facing the shadowy figures of his bullies. 
However, now they appeared not as the monsters of his nightmares, but as mere children, their faces twisted not by malice, but by fear and confusion. Behind them, like puppeteers, were the figures of adults, their features obscured and menacing, manipulating the children into repeating the cycle of cruelty and fear. The headmaster's voice echoed through this tableau, explaining that the true horror of the school was not the acts of the students, but the failure of the adults to break the cycle, to transform the school from a place of fear to one of nurturing and growth. The school's tragedy, he revealed, was not in its haunted halls or spectral figures, but in the lost potential of every child turned tormentor or victim by the neglect of those who should have guided them. As this revelation sank in, the classroom faded, and Alex found himself back in the auditorium, alone on the stage, with the noose still swinging gently above him. The figures in the audience had vanished, leaving only the empty seats and the echo of the headmaster's words. The doors at the back of the auditorium stood open, revealing the first light of dawn, casting long shadows across the floor. With a heavy heart, Alex stepped down from the stage, his mind reeling with the night's revelations. As he walked towards the open doors, the school behind him seemed to grow silent, as if holding its breath. The nightmare was over, but the real journey, the struggle to confront and end the cycle of bullying, was just beginning. As he stepped out into the cold morning air, the school, now just a building, stood silent behind him, its windows reflecting the first light of the new day, waiting for the future to rewrite its legacy. As Alex left the ominous embrace of the school, the dawn's early light seemed to cleanse the night's horrors from his mind. Yet, the echo of the headmaster's revelations lingered, a silent whisper that trailed his every step. The world outside the school's boundary appeared unchanged, but to Alex, everything seemed different, as if he was seeing it all for the first time through eyes opened by his nightmarish journey. Walking through the streets as the city slowly awoke, he saw the remnants of night's shadows retreat before the encroaching daylight. The ordinary sights and sounds of morning felt surreal, a stark contrast to the darkness he had escaped. His mind was a whirlwind of thoughts, trying to piece together the reality of his experiences with the history of the school and the legacy of pain it harbored. Upon reaching his home, the familiarity of his surroundings did little to comfort him. The events of the night hung over him like a dark cloud, casting a shadow over the normalcy of his room, his things, his very life. Alex realized that while he might have left the school, the school had not entirely left him. The memories, the fear, and the resolve stirred by the night's ordeal were now part of him, an indelible mark on his soul. Compelled by a newfound purpose, Alex turned to his computer, his fingers hesitantly hovering over the keyboard. He began to document everything he remembered from the night. The vivid nightmares, the surreal journey through the school, and the chilling encounter with the headmaster. As he typed, the events took on a clearer shape, forming a narrative that was both a confession and a call to action. He posted his story online, not just as a cathartic release, but as a beacon for others who might have suffered similar ordeals. The responses were immediate and overwhelming. 
others began sharing their experiences, their stories echoing Alex's in their themes of fear, isolation, and the desperate need for change. The collective narratives sparked a movement, drawing attention to the school's troubled legacy and the broader issue of bullying. Activists and sympathizers rallied, calling for investigations and reforms. The school, once a silent custodian of years of suffering, became the center of a storm of controversy and debate. Amid this turmoil, strange occurrences began to happen around the school. Workers tasked with renovating the building reported inexplicable phenomena. Tools disappearing, strange noises echoing through the halls, and an oppressive feeling of being watched. The most alarming incidents were the sightings of apparitions, resembling figures from the school's past, wandering the corridors and classrooms, as if the building itself was resisting the changes, clinging to its dark history. These incidents, initially dismissed as stress or tricks of the light, became harder to ignore as they increased in frequency and intensity. The renovations were halted when a construction worker disappeared without a trace, only to be found days later in the old auditorium, unharmed but with no memory of how he got there. The school became a focal point for paranormal investigators and the media its haunted reputation growing with each reported incident. Meanwhile, Alex found himself drawn back to the building, feeling a responsibility to confront the lingering spirits and help them find peace. Armed with research on the school's history and a deep desire to break the cycle of pain, he entered the school once more, this time by the light of day determined to face whatever remnants of the past were clinging to the present. Inside, the atmosphere was heavy with the echo of countless footsteps and whispered voices, the residue of decades of unspoken fears and unshed tears. Alex moved through the halls, each step taking him deeper into the heart of the building's memories. The air thick with the anticipation of impending revelations or confrontations. The school, for so long a silent witness to its own grim legacy, now seemed to be speaking directly to him, its halls and rooms pulsating with the energy of untold stories, waiting to be acknowledged and resolved. Alex felt the boundaries between the past and the present blurring, as if the school existed in a timeless state, a nexus where the echoes of history were as real and palpable as the walls that contained them. He reached the auditorium, the epicenter of the school's haunted history, where the fabric of reality seemed thinnest, and the ghosts of the past were closest to the surface. Stepping onto the stage, Alex felt the intensity of the spotlight once again, not as a beacon of fear, but as a symbol of truth, ready to illuminate the darkest corners of the school's past and his own heart, preparing to confront whatever lay hidden in the shadows, seeking closure and perhaps redemption. In the auditorium, the silence was thick, almost tangible, as Alex stood on the stage. The spotlight above him flickered, casting erratic shadows that danced across the room. He could feel the presence of the school's history around him, a palpable force that seemed to breathe and watch his every move. Alex took a deep breath and called out, his voice echoing through the empty space. 
I know you're here. I feel your pain, your anger, and your sorrow. But it's time to let go, to move on from this place. His words hung in the air, and for a moment, there was silence. Then, gradually, a low murmur began to fill the room, like the rustle of leaves in the wind, growing louder, becoming a cacophony of voices, each clamoring to be heard. Figures began to materialize in the seats of the auditorium. Spectral images of students and teachers from different eras. Their features blurred, but their emotions unmistakable. A mix of sadness, rage, and despair. They were the remnants of the school's troubled past, bound to the building by their unresolved agony. Among these figures, Alex recognized the boy from the newspaper clipping, his face sorrowful, but his eyes meeting Alex's with a glimmer of hope. The boy pointed towards the backstage area, his gesture silent but urgent. Driven by the boy's silent plea, Alex moved off the stage and headed backstage. The whispers of the past following his every step, the area behind the curtains, was a labyrinth of props and costumes, each carrying memories of past performances. A stark contrast to the somber reality of the school's history. As he navigated through the clutter, Alex felt a shift in the atmosphere, as if he were moving through a portal into another time. The whispers grew louder and he could now discern individual voices, pleading, threatening, crying out for attention. The air grew colder, and a faint light glowed from a door ajar at the far end of the backstage area. Approaching the door, Alex pushed it open to reveal a small room, cluttered with old furniture and boxes. In the center stood an antique mirror its surface cloudy and worn. The mirror seemed to call to him, its frame pulsating with a strange energy. As Alex peered into the glass, the room behind him, reflected in the mirror, began to change, displaying scenes from the school's history like a movie reel of misery and torment. The mirror showed him the truth behind the school's haunted legacy. Not just the acts of bullying, but the systemic failures and the silence of those who turned a blind eye. It revealed the pain of those who felt unseen and unheard, their spirits lingering, trapped in a cycle of despair. As he watched, the images in the mirror shifted focusing on the boy from the newspaper. His story unfolded, showing not just his suffering, but also his moments of joy and potential, brutally cut short by his untimely disappearance. Alex understood then that the boy's spirit was the key, the linchpin holding together the tangled web of the school's spectral inhabitants. Determined to unravel the mystery, Alex turned from the mirror and headed deeper into the backstage area, guided by an unseen force. The whispers of the past grew more insistent, leading him to an old, forgotten part of the building, where the air was thick with the dust of decades. Here, in the heart of the school's original structure, the atmosphere was charged with energy, as if this were the core from which the school's haunted essence emanated. The walls were lined with old photographs and documents, layers of history that told the story of a place lost to time, yet alive with the echoes of those who had passed through its halls. Alex felt a convergence of emotions, the collective experiences of generations, and at the center of it all was the boy 
his life and disappearance, a nexus around which the school's dark history revolved. To break the cycle, Alex realized, he needed to uncover the truth of what happened, to bring it into the light and give voice to those who had been silenced. As he delved into the forgotten records and pieced together the fragments of the past, the shadows of the school began to stir, as if sensing the impending revelation. The air grew heavier, the whispers louder, and the boundary between the past and present blurred, setting the stage for a confrontation with the darkness that lurked at the heart of the school's legacy. In the bowels of the old school, where the whispers of the past had led him, Alex uncovered the hidden truth behind the boy's disappearance and the school's haunting legacy. The documents he found, long forgotten and covered in dust, told a story of neglect, of a tragedy that had been swept under the rug by those in power. As Alex pieced together the last of the puzzle, the atmosphere in the school shifted. The oppressive energy that had filled the halls began to dissipate and the spectral figures that had roamed the building started to fade, their expressions softening as the truth was finally acknowledged. The boy's spirit, the central figure in this haunting, appeared before Alex, his expression one of relief and gratitude. With the truth revealed, he could finally move on. His presence no longer a tether for the other spirits trapped within the school's walls. As he vanished, the other apparitions followed, their whispers fading into silence, leaving the building feeling just like an ordinary, albeit old, school. Alex, standing alone in the quiet hall, felt a profound sense of peace. He had faced the darkness of the school's past, in doing so, had freed both the spirits and himself from the weight of unspoken history. The school, once a place of fear and sorrow, now stood silent, its halls empty of the haunting that had pervaded them. Leaving the school, Alex knew that while the building's immediate haunting was resolved, the broader issue of bullying and neglect remained. He vowed to use his experience to continue advocating for change, ensuring that no one else would have to endure what he and so many others had faced. The story of the haunted school and Alex's brave confrontation with its past spread far and wide, inspiring others to speak out and confront their own haunted histories. The school itself was eventually renovated and reopened, but with a new focus on understanding and compassion. Its legacy of pain replaced by one of hope and healing. And though the school moved on, the memories of those who had suffered there remained. A reminder of the past's impact on the present. But now, these memories served not as a source of torment, but as a driving force for positive change, a testament to the power of facing and overcoming the darkest of truths. In the end, the true horror was not the ghosts that haunted the school, but the reality of human cruelty and indifference, and the true heroism was not in the vanquishing of specters, but in the courage to confront and rectify the wrongs of the living. Alex's journey through the nightmarish halls of his school had ended, but the story of his fight against the shadows of injustice had just begun. A beacon of light in the darkness, guiding the way toward a better, kinder 
future. When Eliza took the job as a cleaner for the old mansion at the edge of town, she thought it was her lucky break. The pay was generous, and the owner, Mr. Harrow, an elderly recluse, asked for nothing more than thoroughness and discretion. The mansion, long rumored to be haunted, stood like a silent behemoth, its windows like dark, watchful eyes. On her first day, Eliza felt a chill run down her spine as she crossed the threshold. The air inside was stale, heavy with the scent of decay and neglect. As she began her work, the silence of the house pressed in on her, broken only by the echo of her footsteps and the distant, unidentifiable creaks and moans of the old structure. She started in the main hall, where portraits of the Harrow family lined the walls, their faces stern and eyes seeming to follow her every move. As she dusted and cleaned, she couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. In the grand ballroom, with its opulent but faded decorations, she noticed a grand piano, its keys dusty but intact. Curiosity got the better of her, and she pressed a key. The sound it produced was a discordant, lingering note that seemed to fill the room and chill the air. From then on, things began to feel increasingly off. Doors she was sure she'd left open would be closed when she returned, and lights flickered without reason. Whispers seemed to float through the halls always just out of clear hearing. And more than once, she thought she saw shadows moving in the periphery of her vision. The house's layout was a labyrinth of corridors and rooms that seemed to subtly shift when she wasn't looking, disorienting her and making her question her memory. Eliza found herself in parts of the mansion she didn't remember entering, facing doors that were locked, with cold, unyielding surfaces that seemed to throb with a life of their own. One day, while cleaning a long disused study, she found a hidden door behind a bookshelf. It led to a narrow staircase spiraling down into darkness. Compelled by a mix of fear and curiosity, Eliza descended. The air grew colder with each step, and the oppressive silence of the mansion seemed to deepen. At the bottom of the staircase, she discovered a small, dimly lit room filled with strange artifacts and old tomes. In the center stood a peculiar object covered by a dusty cloth. As she approached and reached out to unveil the object, the whispers surged to a deafening roar, and the temperature dropped sharply, frosting her breath. Just as her fingers touched the cloth, the door behind her slammed shut, plunging the room into darkness. In that moment, Eliza felt a presence behind her, something ancient and malevolent, its breath cold on her neck. Panicked, Eliza spun around her eyes struggling to pierce the darkness that now enveloped the room. The faint light from the stairwell barely illuminated the outlines of objects, casting elongated shadows that seemed to twist and writhe on the walls. Her breath came in short, sharp gasps, each exhale a cloud of mist in the cold air. The presence behind her felt overwhelmingly oppressive, a weight on her shoulders and a whisper in her ear. Unintelligible, yet clearly menacing, the room felt alive, pulsing with a malevolent energy that seemed eager to escape its confines. The covered object in the center of the room began to emit a low, throbbing hum, as if resonating with the unseen entity. 
fumbling for her phone to use as a makeshift torch. Eliza's fingers trembled as she illuminated the room. The light from the phone cast stark, glaring beams onto the walls, revealing the covered object. A large, ornate mirror with an intricately carved frame depicting scenes of anguish and despair. The cloth that had covered it lay on the floor, as if it had been pulled away by unseen hands. As she approached the mirror, the air grew denser, and the whispering intensified, now words forming in a language she couldn't understand, but felt inexplicably terrifying. The mirror's surface rippled, and for a moment, it seemed to beckon her closer, its depths swirling with shadowy figures. Eliza's reflection was distorted, her features twisted in fear. Behind her reflection, she caught glimpses of other figures, their forms blurred, but their presence undeniable. These were the inhabitants of the mansion, trapped within the mirror their faces contorted in eternal screams of terror. The urge to look away was strong, but something compelled Eliza to keep watching as the figures in the mirror reached towards her, their fingers clawing at the glass. The cold from the mirror seeped into her bones, a chill that spoke of hidden truths and buried secrets. Then, the mirror's surface began to clear, revealing a vision of the mansion's past. Scenes of opulent parties that slowly turned sinister, with guests disappearing into shadowy corners, never to reappear. The Harrow family was there, not as mere observers, but as orchestrators of the horrors that unfolded, their eyes gleaming with a dark, hungry light. As the scenes played out, Eliza realized that the mansion was not just a home, but a prison for the souls it had claimed, their agony feeding its cursed existence. The Harrows, bound to the house as much as their victims, were trapped in a cycle of darkness, their actions in life haunting them in death. The mirror then showed Eliza a hidden room beneath the mansion, where the darkest of rituals had been performed, giving the house its power and its curse. She knew instinctively that this was where the heart of the mansion's malevolence lay, where the energy that powered the haunting was strongest. The vision in the mirror shifted again, now showing Eliza herself standing in the room beneath the house, surrounded by shadows. The image was so clear, so precise, that it felt more like a premonition than a simple reflection. The whispering crescendoed into a cacophony, the voices of the mansion's past inhabitants pleading with her, warning her, commanding her to find the hidden room and break the cycle, the presence behind her, no longer just a feeling of dread, began to materialize, taking on the form of Mr. Harrow, his eyes empty and sorrowful. As the vision faded and the mirror's surface returned to its reflective state, Eliza heard the door behind her unlock with a soft click. The room, though still chillingly cold, felt less oppressive, as if the unveiling of the mirror had loosened the mansion's hold. Eliza knew what she had to do, with a mixture of fear and determination. She turned away from the mirror and made her way back up the staircase, her mind racing with the revelations she had witnessed. The mansion, with its twisting corridors and hidden secrets, awaited her exploration, its darkest corners yet to be uncovered. The story of the Harrows and the true nature of the house's haunting were intertwined, 
and Eliza was the key to unraveling them. Eliza emerged from the staircase, her mind reeling with the revelations of the mirror. The mansion, once merely a job, had become her curse and her quest. She could feel the building's watchful gaze as she navigated its corridors, each step taking her deeper into its haunted heart. The daylight that once filtered through the curtains was now a distant memory, replaced by an eternal twilight that seemed to bleed from the walls themselves. The mansion's once grand rooms were now scenes of faded glory, their opulence marred by the patina of neglect and the stains of darker deeds. Armed with the knowledge from the mirror, Eliza sought the hidden room beneath the mansion, the source of its malevolent energy. Her journey was hindered by the house itself, which seemed to warp and shift to disorient her. Doors leading to different rooms than before, staircases looping back on themselves in impossible architecture. The whispers of the past grew more urgent, guiding and goading her. The spirits of the mansion, once menacing, now seemed to recognize her as their potential liberator, their voices blending into a guiding chorus. In her search, Eliza encountered the spectral remnants of the Harrows, their figures flickering between moments of human decency and monstrous depravity. They were prisoners of their own making ensnared by the dark rituals that had promised them power, but delivered only eternal damnation. Finally, in the mansion's neglected east wing, she found a decrepit door hidden behind a tattered tapestry, its threads depicting the twisted history of the Harrow family. The door's iron handle was cold, its surface etched with symbols that seemed to writhe under her touch. Pushing the door open, Eliza descended into the bowels of the mansion, each step taking her further from the world of the living and deeper into the domain of the dead. The staircase spiraled down, the air growing thicker, the darkness almost tangible, pressing against her like a suffocating blanket. At the staircase's end was a vast, cavernous chamber, its walls lined with ancient stone carvings that narrated the mansion's sordid past. In the center of the room stood a stone altar, its surface stained with the remnants of old sacrifices, the air around it shimmering with a spectral light. The heart of the mansion's curse pulsed before her, a nexus of tortured souls and dark energies. The whispers were now deafening, a symphony of sadness, rage, and pleading. Shadowy figures circled the chamber, their forms blurring between human and monstrous, trapped in a dance of despair. Eliza approached the altar, the source of the house's malevolent life force. The spirits of the mansion swirled around her, their stories flashing before her eyes in vivid detail, showing her the full extent of the tragedy and horror that the Harrow legacy had wrought. As she reached out to touch the altar, the spirits surged forward, their voices crescendoing in a final plea. The air crackled with energy and the ground beneath her trembled as if the mansion itself were protesting her presence, her challenge to its very foundation of horror. Just as her fingers brushed the cold stone, a flash of blinding light filled the chamber, and the voices of the mansion's countless victims rose in a thunderous climax, demanding release, demanding justice, the walls of the chamber shook, the carvings glowing with an otherworldly light, revealing the true horror 
of the rituals that had given birth to the mansion's curse. Eliza stood at the precipice of truth, her actions at the altar poised to unravel the tangled web of the Harrow's dark past, potentially freeing the spirits or damning her to join their ranks. The mansion held its breath, waiting for the choice that would seal its fate and hers. The chamber quaked as the spirits' cries reached a fever pitch, their ethereal forms swirling around Eliza in a maelstrom of anguish and anger. The air was electric, thick with the power of uncounted years of suffering, and the dark rituals that had bound these souls to the mansion. Eliza, standing at the heart of this storm of spectral energy, felt a connection to the spirits, understanding their pain and their thirst for release. As her hand made contact with the altar, visions flooded her mind, a torrent of memories not her own. She saw the Harrow family through the ages, delving deeper into dark arts, each generation binding themselves further to the mansion and its growing hunger for misery and despair. She witnessed the construction of the mansion, built upon the site of ancient and forgotten rites, its foundations laid in blood and shadow. In this whirlwind of revelations, Eliza understood that the mansion was more than a structure. It was a living entity, grown powerful on the souls it consumed and the atrocities it housed. The Harrows, though instigators of much of the darkness, were also victims, ensnared by the legacy they had helped create. The chamber's energy coalesced around Eliza, the spirits pressing in, eager for release, but fearful of the unknown. She could feel the mansion's resistance, its walls pulsing like a giant heart, trying to expel her and maintain its grip on the souls it held. Eliza's resolve hardened. With a deep, steadying breath, she pushed her energy into the altar, her willpower battling the mansions. The stone surface beneath her hand glowed, runes and symbols igniting with light, casting eerie shadows that played across the chamber's walls, making the carvings seem to move and twist in agony and anger. A seismic shift occurred within the mansion's very essence. The building groaned and shuddered, as if in pain, the air vibrating with the sound of cracking stone and splintering wood. The spectral figures around her intensified, their faces contorting in expressions of hope and terror, as the chains that bound them to the mansion began to weaken. The ground beneath Eliza's feet cracked, the fissures spreading like lightning across the chamber floor, glowing with the same eerie light as the altar. The shadows cast by the light began to take on forms, enacting scenes of the mansion's past, playing out the tragedies that had occurred within its walls. These shadow plays revealed hidden truths, not just the cruelty and malice, but moments of regret and longing for redemption among the Harrows and their victims alike. The mansion, desperate to preserve its existence, fought back, its energy manifesting as dark, tendrilled shadows that snaked towards Eliza, attempting to pry her away from the altar the combined will of Eliza and the spirits was a force greater than the mansion had ever encountered. As they pushed back against the darkness, the room brightened. The light from the altar and the fissures in the floor illuminating the chamber with a brilliance that had never
ever before penetrated the mansion's cursed walls. Outside the chamber, the rest of the mansion began to respond to the upheaval at its heart. Hallways twisted and convulsed, rooms blurred and shifted. The physical manifestation of the mansion's agony and resistance to the change being forced upon it. As the battle of wills raged, the boundaries between the physical and spiritual within the mansion blurred, the past and present colliding in a tumultuous clash of energies. Eliza, at the center of this chaos, stood as the fulcrum, the key to ending the cycle of suffering and releasing the bound souls to their deserved rest. The spirits, gaining strength from Eliza's determination, rallied, their forms becoming more distinct, their faces etched with resolve. Together, they surged towards the darkness that fought to maintain its hold. A tidal wave of light against the consuming shadow. In this epic struggle, the very essence of the mansion was laid bare, its darkest secrets exposed to the purifying light, setting the stage for the final confrontation between the legacy of the Harrows and the quest for redemption and release that Eliza had unwittingly become the champion of. The chamber trembled under the force of the conflict. The stone altar at its center, now a beacon of blinding light, battling the creeping darkness that sought to smother its glow. Eliza, connected to the altar, felt both the agony of the mansion and the desperate hope of the spirits converging within her, a storm of emotions and power that threatened to overwhelm her senses. The mansion, sentient and cunning, unleashed its final gambit, manifesting the darkest fears and memories of its victims into tangible forms. These phantoms, twisted and grotesque, emerged from the shadows. Their features, a nightmarish blend of human and spectral elements, representing the corrupted essence of the mansion's soul. Eliza, steadied by the presence of the spirits, confronted these manifestations, recognizing them as the embodiment of the pain and suffering the mansion had inflicted over centuries. Each phantom that approached her was met with a surge of energy from the altar, dissolving them into motes of light that were absorbed back into the swirling maelstrom of spiritual energy filling the room. As the battle intensified, the very foundation of the mansion groaned and cracked, its physical form beginning to crumble under the strain of the spiritual upheaval. The walls of the chamber buckled, revealing glimpses of other realities. Other times that the mansion had existed through each layer peeling back to expose the core of its dark heart. In this chaos, the spirits of the Harrow family emerged, their spectral forms more solid and defined, no longer just victims or perpetrators, but central figures in the mansion's tragic narrative. They approached Eliza, not with malice, but with a solemn acknowledgement of their role in the creation of this malevolent entity, the patriarch of the Harrow family, a figure of imposing stature and authority even in death, locked eyes with Eliza in this silent communion. A flood of understanding passed between them, a shared recognition of the pain that had bound their fates together. He extended his hand towards Eliza, offering it in a gesture of alliance, an unspoken plea for her help to undo the wrongs that had been perpetrated. 
joining hands with the Harrow Patriarch, Eliza became a conduit for the combined energies of the spirits and the mansion. Her resolve fused with their collective desire for redemption. The light from the altar pulsed, its rhythm quickening, beating like a heart in sync with Eliza's own, driving back the darkness with each surge. The chamber's atmosphere was electric, charged with the potential for transformation or destruction. The mansion's essence writhed and convulsed, its identity fracturing as the light infiltrated its deepest recesses. Unearthing secrets long buried and wounds long festering, Eliza, anchored by the harrows, stood as a beacon of change. Her presence, the fulcrum on which the mansion's fate balanced. With each breath, she drew more of the darkness into the light, unraveling the threads of malice and sorrow that had woven the mansion's cursed existence. The battle reached its zenith, the forces of light and dark clashing in a tumultuous crescendo that echoed through the realms of the living and the dead. The mansion, besieged by the power of redemption and faced with the dissolution of its dark legacy, shuddered in a final act of defiance, or perhaps surrender, the outcome of which hung precariously in the balance, a moment suspended between salvation and damnation. In this climactic struggle, where every second stretched into eternity, the true nature of the mansion was revealed, not just as a place of horror and tragedy, but as a crucible for redemption and the hope of a new beginning. Its future and the fate of its many souls resting in Eliza's determined hands as the light and darkness collided within the heart of the mansion. The very fabric of the building twisted and writhed, corridors and rooms folding upon themselves in impossible geometries. The mansion, now a battleground for its soul, resonated with the echoes of its tumultuous history. Each reverberation a story of pain and redemption. The Harrow family spirits, united with Eliza, lent their strength to the fight, their knowledge of the mansion's secrets, allowing them to guide and amplify her efforts. Together, they peeled back the layers of corruption and despair that had infused the building's walls, exposing the raw, pulsing heart of the mansion's consciousness. Eliza, her senses extended beyond the physical, traversed the mansion's memories, witnessing the centuries of its existence in moments. She saw the building in its infancy, a grand home filled with hope and promise before it was tainted by the dark deeds that would define its legacy. With each memory she touched, she unraveled the knots of darkness, liberating the trapped energies and spirits within. The mansion, sensing its impending transformation or destruction, unleashed a maelstrom of psychic energy, manifesting as physical storms within its halls. Windows shattered, sending shards flying like deadly rain. Walls cracked and groaned under the strain, and the very ground trembled as if the earth itself sought to dislodge the accursed structure from its surface. In the center of this chaos, the altar glowed brighter, its light a piercing beacon against the encroaching darkness. Eliza, with the harrows, stood firm, her mind a conduit for the flood of spiritual energy that sought release. With each pulse of light from the altar, more of the mansion's dark essence was dissolved, 
its hold on reality weakening. The spirits of those who had suffered within the mansion's walls began to coalesce, forming a spectral army that rallied to Eliza's side. They were the innocent and the wronged, their numbers legion, each one a thread in the tapestry of the mansion's dark history. Together, they pushed against the darkness, their combined willpower a force more potent than any physical weapon. The battle raged, a tumultuous clash of wills and powers, the outcome uncertain, the mansion, desperate to preserve its existence, tapped into the deepest wells of its dark power, creating illusions and realities designed to break Eliza's resolve. She found herself facing not just the physical manifestations of the mansion's darkness, but also the psychological torments and fears it conjured from her mind. But Eliza was not alone. With the support of the Harrow spirits and the liberated souls, she navigated the treacherous landscape of her fears, confronting and overcoming the personal demons that the mansion used against her. Each victory over these illusions strengthened her, her successes empowering the spirits and weakening the mansion's defenses. As the battle reached its climax, the mansion itself began to fracture. Its physical form unable to contain the immense energies unleashed within its walls. The boundary between the spiritual and material worlds blurred creating a liminal space where the rules of neither fully applied. In this realm of fluctuating reality, Eliza and the spirits found the final chains that bound the mansion's essence, the core of its dark power. Together, they approached this nexus, a swirling vortex of shadow and light, where the mansion's heart beat in sync with the pulse of the altar. Here, in this place of power, the final confrontation would take place. A duel not of strength, but of spirit, where the outcome would decide not just the fate of the mansion and its spectral inhabitants, but the very nature of its legacy in the world of the living. The vortex of shadow and light at the mansion's core, pulsed with the energy of centuries. A storm of history and emotion that swirled around Eliza and the Harrow spirits. This was the source of the mansion's power, the anchor point of all the suffering and darkness it had absorbed and perpetuated. As they neared the vortex, the air was thick with the echoes of cries and whispers, the residual pain of every soul touched by the mansion's curse. The shadows within the vortex lashed out, forming tendrils of darkness that sought to ensnare Eliza and drag her into the abyss at its center. But Eliza, surrounded by the spirits of the Harrow family and the other victims, was not deterred. She felt a deep, resonant connection to the spirits, a bond forged in shared struggle and mutual resolve. They encircled the vortex, their combined energy forming a barrier of light that repelled the shadows. The mansion's consciousness, aware of its impending doom or salvation, fought back with renewed fury. It conjured phantasms of its darkest moments, reliving the tragedies that had unfolded within its walls. In a bid to overwhelm Eliza and her spectral allies with despair and fear, yet with each memory, each resurgence of past horrors, the group's resolve only strengthened. They countered the mansion's despair with their own memories of love, happiness, and hope. The moments of light that had also occurred within its walls. 
though overshadowed by the prevailing darkness. This battle of wills, fought on the plane of memory and emotion, raged with increasing intensity. The very structure of the mansion began to quake and groan. Its physical form, unable to contain the spiritual turmoil within, cracks spread across the floors and walls, ceilings buckled, and the once opulent decorations disintegrated into dust. As the physical manifestation of the mansion began to collapse under the weight of its own tortured history, in the eye of this storm, at the heart of the vortex, Eliza and the Harrow Patriarch faced the darkest part of the mansion's essence. It was a swirling mass of blackness, a concentration of all the hate, pain, and sadness the house had ever known. To confront it, they had to enter the vortex, to touch the very heart of the mansion's darkness. As they stepped into the vortex, time and space seemed to lose meaning. They were immersed in the raw essence of the mansion, experiencing its entire history in a series of fleeting, intense moments. They saw the mansion's construction, the lives it had touched, the slow descent into darkness, and the moments of resistance against it. Eliza and the Harrow Patriarch, now at the center of the mansion's spiritual nexus, found the chains that tethered the mansion to its dark past. These chains, forged from centuries of sorrow and wrongdoing, were the final barrier to freeing the mansion and its victims from the cycle of pain. Together, they reached out to the chains, their hands glowing with the combined light of hundreds of spirits. As they touched the chains, a surge of energy coursed through the vortex, the light clashing with the darkness in a blinding explosion of power. The mansion's essence convulsed, caught in the throes of transformation as the chains began to dissolve, each link breaking with the release of pent-up spiritual energy. The shadows within the vortex screamed and howled, their forms disintegrating as the light overwhelmed them, their existence ending in a final, desperate wail of defeat. Outside, the physical mansion continued to crumble, its form breaking apart as the spiritual foundation that had sustained it was dismantled. But even as it fell, there was a sense of liberation, of a great burden being lifted, not just from the structure, but from the land itself and the souls tied to it. In this climactic moment, the line between victory and oblivion was razor thin. The fate of Eliza, the Harrow spirits, and the mansion hanging in the balance, poised on the brink of either total annihilation or a new, uncertain dawn. <laughs>